In the long term, it's a much bigger issue. Price instability, inflation and deflation are both very hard in terms of the impact on the economy. They make us make long decisions. While the government's been very worried about deflation, and I understand that if you owe a bunch of money like the government, <coughs> you worry about de uh, deflation. In my career, inflation has been a much bigger issue. Um, from the creation of the U.S. in the 1780s until the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the prices in the U.S. were basically stable. I mean, they, they went up and down, but the price level stayed the same. From 1913 to the day, prices have risen 2,000%. Even more fundamental than the financial stuff is the attack on free markets. Uh, the long-term well-being of, uh, of any country is based on economic freedom, individual rights, free markets, property rights. The attack on free markets is very destructive to our well-being. It's unfortunate people don't realize this, that government policies really cause these problems. Not that individual companies didn't make mistakes, but we haven't had, a, uh, haven't had a failure of markets. Also, the attack on the wealthy is very destructive. Now, it's not every wealthy person is not productive, but the most productive people tend to, tend to be very wealthy. So if you attack the productive, you're going to reduce your standing. Now, it's great politics. It's great politics. Roosevelt did that during the 30s, but it's terrible economics. What happens when you attack productive people they, they kind of go on what I call a mini strike. They become more cautious. Instead of opening five locations next year and creating 500 jobs, maybe they open one location or maybe they open no locations and create many less jobs. So it's good politics, but it's terrible economics to attack the productive. Um, we need to privatize uh, and li or liquidate Freddie and Fannie. The political risk will never go away. The way to do that is to encourage the recreation of the origination and whole model, let financial institutions, strong financial institutions, portfolio home mortgages that work for years and years in the savings and loan industry. Uh, in Canada, uh, the, the Canadian banks uh, hold mortgages just like the old savings and loans do, and the Canadian banking system is now probably the soundest financial system in the world, and one reason is because the Canadian banks portfolio home mortgages. If I were in charge, and I won't be in charge, uh, I would go to a private banking system and a market-determined uh, monetary base. Now, that would probably be a gold standard, not because there's anything magic about gold, but because gold is hard to find and expensive to dig up. So it's hard to manipulate the quantity of gold. Uh, that contrasts totally with the Federal Reserve, which can print all the money it wants to, which almost always leads to financial problems in the long term. If we're not going to a private banking system based on a market-based gold standard, uh, then we at least need to strip the Federal Reserve of powers. Don't give them any more powers and, and make them quit micromanaging. One of the suggestions by the great economist Milton Friedman was to grow the monetary supply to 3% fixed rate. In my career, the Federal Reserve has erred every time in terms of determining the growth rate. And, and it's hard to see that because there's several years delay, but they've created these booms and busts uh, because of mismanagement of the monetary system. Let's assume we're not going to do that. Then this is maybe a very practical solution. I uh, would be first to require banks to maintain <coughs> a much higher capital than they do today, probably at least 25% equity. Uh, and we need to do that over a period of time so banks could raise capital. That would shift the risk from the taxpayers and the public to the owners of the bank, which is a legit, legitimate place to be. It would also answer the too big to fail question. Either Citigroup could raise capital or not. If they could raise capital, then they could continue to grow. If not, they'd have to shrink. That'd be a, a market-based answer. Secondly, we should either eliminate FDIC insurance, which we probably won't do, but at least reduce it back to $100,000 so it has less effect on the market. Uh, thirdly, we need to make it explicitly clear and illegal for the Federal Reserve to bail out non-banks. You can't bail out General Electric. If you, if you finance General Electric, then you take the risk. And finally, and very importantly, at least 90% of the government regulations that impact the industry need to be eliminated so that so the banking business can be globally competitive. Um, long term, we need to stop subsidizing housing. That creates uh, capital going in the wrong place instead of in, into investment technologies. We need to materially reduce government expenditures as a percentage of GDP. Those are the least productive expenditures. We need to encourage productive investment with low and neutral tax rates. We need to encourage free trade. Uh, free trade raises the standard of living. In fact, one of the big reasons that the Depression happened was the United States initiated a tariff war. We raised our tariffs and of course everybody else responded and that contributed significantly uh, to, the, to the depression. We need to carefully and systemat systematically privatize Medicare and, and, and Social Security. We got huge deficits there. We need to cut the cost of the defense by defending the United States. We also need to encourage immigration of the productive and the hard working. Uh, the United States was built by 
immigrants, by the way. Uh, and also, we have a big demographic problem. We got a huge percentage of our population that's getting ready to retire, the baby boomers. And as people get older, they become less productive. In fact, a lot of people talk about the economic problems that Japan has faced, and, and they, they ignore the, the basic problem. They have an aging population, and you can't sustain productivity as your population gets older. So we need, we need immigrants, and we particularly need smart people. Smart people create jobs. Uh, if we keep smart people in India, they'll create jobs. They'll just be in India instead of, instead of the United States. We obviously need to uh, restore discipline, save more, and spend less. Um, Far, far more important than the economic issues are the philosophical issues. The real causes of the financial crisis are philosophical. And the real causes are a combination of altruism and pragmatism. Where did affordable housing come from? Everybody has a right to a house provided by who? Uh, where does free medical care come from? Everybody has a right to medical care provided by who? That is exactly the opposite of the American concept of rights. If I, have a, if I have a right to free medical care, then I have a right to imprison a doctor to give me that medical care or, or imprison somebody else to give me the money uh, to pay that doctor. Uh, the American concept of rights is, is you have the right to the product of your own label, to what you produce, what you create, but you don't have the right to what somebody else produces. Uh, altruism leads to a redistribution from the productive to the non-productive, and it says nobody has a right to their own life. Everybody is a slave. And then you combine altruism with pragmatism. And, and the truth is you can't be in business and really be an altruist. You can't stay in business. So a lot of business people become pragmatic. In fact, that's what we tend to teach in our, our business schools. And pragmatic means do what works. The unfortunate reality is a lot of things work in the short term that are extremely destructive in the long term. Pick a payment mortgages work for a long period of time. Pragmatism leads to a lack of rationality because you can't, to be rational, you have to take a long-term perspective. It also it leads to a lack of integrity. To have integrity, you, can, you can't have a long-term, you have to have a long-term perspective. The combination of altruism and pragmatism leads to the free lunch mentality. We saw that demonstrated in the last presidential election where neither presidential candidate offered any solution for Social Security and Medicare where we have giant deficits, giant deficits. And if they had, they wouldn't have been elected. The free lunch mentality leads to a lack of personal responsibility. And a lack of personal responsibility is the death of democracies. The Founding Fathers were aware of that. They talked about the tyranny of the majority. They really were talking about the ability of the majority to take away the rights of minorities and freedom of speech, freedom of religion, etc. But they also said, you know, if 51% of the population believes they can get a free lunch from the other 49%, pretty soon the game is over. Because then it, won't, then it becomes 60% want a free lunch from the 40%, and then it's 70% want a free lunch from the 30%, and then the 30% quit. Just like the cause is philosophical, so is the cure. The United States was based on a very different set of moral principles. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's moral right to the pursuit of their personal happiness. Each individual's right to the product of their own labor including the right to give it away if they choose to who they choose to. Interestingly enough, that concept demands personal responsibility because there is no free lunch, no free lunch. It also demands and rewards rationality and self-discipline. The United States was founded on a unique idea, the only time in history, each individual's moral right and moral obligation to the pursuit of their rational, long-term self-interest in the context of what I call the, the traitor principle, really about creating win-win relationships. Uh, in our business, one of our fundamental commitments is help our clients achieve economic success and financial security, and yet we expect to make a profit doing it. We're trying to get better together. In fact, in life, we absolutely should not take advantage of other people. Taking advantage of other people doesn't work. We're not trusted. It's also, we become paranoid when we do that. In addition, we shouldn't self-sacrifice because each of us has a moral right to our life. What we really are is traitors. We get better to better, and life is about creating win-win relationships. Um, my favorite book uh, was Atlas Rugg, uh, written by Ayn Rand in 1957. Rand wrote this book with the purpose of making her predictions not become true. Unfortunately, her predictions are becoming true. Uh, if you haven't read Atlas Shrugged, you ought to read it. And if you had not read it recently, you ought to read it again because it really has some, some tremendous insights on the philosophical basis of the problems that we, we face today.